Good morning, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins briefing. Today's briefing will spotlight recent prescription drug shortages. My name is Lainey Rutko, and I'm Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Initiatives at Johns Hopkins University. I'm also a professor in the Bloomberg School of Public Health and the School of Advanced International Studies. I'll be moderating today's briefing. Prescription drug shortages can occur for any number of reasons from supply chain issues to discontinuation of a product. But whatever the reason, when prescription drugs are needed and not available, there are serious implications at both the individual and population levels. It's important to understand why these shortages occur, how we can prepare for them, and what is being done to mitigate their impact. I'm pleased to be joined by several of my colleagues today from across Johns Hopkins University. Amanda Fader is Vice Chair of Gynecologic Surgical Operations, Director of the Center for Rare Gynecologic Cancers at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Ting Long Dai is Professor of Operations Management and Business Analytics at the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. Mariana Sokol is an Associate Scientist at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Josh Sharfstein is Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and Professor of the Practice at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Before I turn to each of our panelists for their initial thoughts, I want to remind our audience that we will be providing answers to your questions today in real time. So please submit your questions for our experts in the box that you see at the bottom of your screen. And when you do so, if possible, please include your organizational affiliation. We're going to start with each of our panelists providing a brief overview of key topics, and then we'll turn to Q&A. Amanda, first to you. You have a real boots on the ground perspective here. Can you tell us in your clinical experience, what have been the implications of prescription drug shortages for cancer treatment? Thank you so much for having me, Lainey. Well, to put things into perspective, the issue of drug shortages in the U.S. is not a new problem, but one that has existed uh, for more than a decade. And as you mentioned, drug shortages may occur due to a variety of reasons, from increased drug demand, logistical challenges, labor supply chain issues, quality control issues at the facilities that manufacture drugs, or uh, simply pharmaceutical manufacturer decisions, among other things. Um, But what is particularly problematic in the current era is that we're seeing an increase year after year in the number of drugs in shortage and the number of classes of drugs in shortage. And in my field, in oncology, we're unfortunately seeing that many life-saving chemotherapy drugs that we use to treat both adults and children are the drugs that are in the most critical shortage at this time. And chemotherapy drugs are, as many know, among the most important medicines we use to treat adults and children uh, with cancer. Uh, My colleagues say, you know, among the most important tools or weapons we have as oncologists to help our patients. They help save and extend lives. And so unfortunately, um, when we see chemotherapy drugs as a class of drugs that's consistently in the top five of drugs that are in shortage and that that's increasing, that creates a real problem. Um, and what we have now is, uh, unfortunately, over the last three months, we've seen an unfolding uh, in the number of drugs that are in shortage. And we now can say that we have a shortage of 15 indispensable chemotherapy drugs that are used to treat a wide variety of cancers, including the gynecologic cancers like I treat, ovarian, uterine, vulvar cervical cancers, lung cancers, many patients with breast cancer, prostate, head and neck, esophageal, bladder, and testicular cancers. And the concern is that the drugs that are in most severe shortage right now, they're called the platinum drugs or cisplatin and carboplatin, are the chemotherapy backbone and treatment of most of these cancers. And they're often curative treatments. So this is unfortunately impacting hundreds of thousands of patients across the country right now and has escalated quite quickly over the last, <clears throat> excuse me, three months, <clears throat> excuse me, to the level of a public health crisis. Um, and frankly, we may be in one of the worst, you know, chemotherapy drug shortages in U.S. history. 
Thank you so much, Amanda. And I'm sure we'll be receiving many questions for you when we move to, to Q&A. Ting Long, I'm now going to turn to you. Can you help us to understand prescription drug shortages in the context of supply chain challenges? Oh, sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lenny, for uh, this warm, uh, for including me on this very distinguished uh, uh, briefing. Uh, as a supply chain expert, I'm deeply concerned about ongoing drug shortage crisis because we have, because it has life and death implications, as my colleague Amanda pointed out earlier. So the crisis of this crisis is a crisis of quality. Uh, of course, there are many layers of complex issues surrounding the current crisis, such as the pricing, purpose incentives, the sourcing, and the transparency, they are all relevant. And yes, even panic buying could play a role. Uh, but you know, the other thing to remember is that this is not a low margin industry. A study from Brookings Institution back in 2017 found that the gross margin for generic drugs is 50%, is about 50%. That's a very, very high margin uh, by any standard. Um, however, because my time is very limited, so I will focus on giving you a really, uh, you know, folks uh, picture of the issue, which is about quality. So the ongoing shortage of cancer drugs, particularly, uh, you, you know, planting drugs, as Amanda mentioned earlier, was triggered by shutdown of a factory in India run by Inter's uh, pharmaceuticals. So before the shutdown, the FDA found uh, stunning quality control problems as a plant. So the FDA inspection of the factory revealed a cascade of failures, just to quote this agency, in quality control, including problems with data integrity, standard documentation, uh, practices accuracy, reproducibility of test methods on products and the procedures to prevent microbiological contamination. The inspection even found a truck full of shredded documents near the facility. So people can talk about honestly about the pricing, competition, et cetera, but the root cause of this particular case is very simple, it's quality control. And this is not just an isolated incident. According to 2019 report to Congress, the majority, more than 60% of drug shortages were attributed to quality issues that disrupt the drug supply. So even before that, in 2013, Two FDA researchers wrote a paper with a very revealing title, Drug Shortages Calling, The Cycle of a Quantity and a Quality. So the quantity is really closely driven by quality concerns. Now, if this situation sounds familiar, it is because we have seen this movie before almost every year. The story is just getting really old, really boring, to be honest. And let me remind everyone of the baby formula shortage crisis we experienced here in the US last year. To call it a shortage would be to glorify this crisis because a more concerning issue is the safety of the baby formulas. We know that at least four infants have died since early 2021 after consuming formula produced by an Abbott nutrition plant in Michigan, which is the largest in the US until it was uh, shut down. And the father of the infant death were under investigation, but are not directly linked to the plant. In the case of the infant formula, however, the safety issue that led to the shortage is far more alarming and, and raises concerns about other food regulation, about the Food and the Drug Administration. So this is an American tragedy, fully preventable. Uh, if FDA has done the bare minimum that consumers expect by conducting regular safe, safety inspections and responding to whistleblower complaints. So now get back to the current crisis. Um, in the case of infant formula, almost 100% uh, products was made domestically. So even for this industry, FDA has proven it's incapable of inspecting factories in a rigorous and a timely fashion. Now, if FDA cannot inspect the largest domestic baby formula factory in Michigan, can we trust that it has the capacity and capability to inspect a large network of foreign manufacturers, most of them in India and China? I think it would take a miracle for us to believe that. In 2022, the FDA inspected only 6%, single digit, 6% of nearly 3,000 foreign facilities, 6%. And 
most of the generic drugs Americans consume will be using are from those facilities. Even for those inspections that did happen, we have a reason to question their rigor. According to 2019 NPR report, in one case, FDA investigators in India was poisoned during the inspection and fell sick. In another case, uh, an investigator's hotel room was bugged. And these factories produce generic drugs that we consume, and more than 90%, 9 out of 10 of all prescriptions filled in the United States are for generic drugs. So the supply chain we're talking about is a very fragile one, one that has human consequences, even life and death consequences. Um, the supply chain we're talking about is very opaque, mostly foreign, and inspections are weak and almost non-existent. Uh, there are many, many policy proposals, but let's at, at least admit defeat first. So let's admit that FDA is incapable of effectively inspecting domestic drug manufacturers, and its ability to inspect foreign drug manufacturers is minimal. Let's admit that we cannot rely on foreign made generic drugs and assume that they are safe and effective. If we make that assumption, let's admit that we are ignorant. Let's admit that while everyone focuses on quality, the real issue here is quality. So it's quality, stupid. So let's admit that we are flying blind. So let's admit that this is a classical supply chain coordination failure, a failure that any supply chain 101 student can easily identify. So let's admit that this is a market of failure. We have a market for lemons, to borrow the theory of a Nobel laureate, uh, Geoff Akurov. In this market, when the buyer cannot distinguish good manufacturing practices from bad manufacturing practices, and the FDA cannot detect the difference through frequent, effective, and rigorous inspections, we see in equilibrium low prices for bad products. So in the case of ongoing drug shortage, FDA is given an impossible task, and we all pretend the supply chain is fine, where well, we now know it's not. Either we take steps to phase out our dependence on foreign manufacturers, or the FDA must do a better job of quality inspections, and we need to strengthen quality standards, and we need to provide more funding for manufacturers to upgrade their product, production facilities, especially for older drugs. So this is essential to restore the market, to make sure we don't fall victim to low quality equilibrium. This is essential for our health, our parents' health and our children's health. So I will turn back to Lenny. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tingman. Mariana, I'll now turn to you. Given what we've heard from our first two panelists, can you give us your take on the current crisis and also where you see opportunities for potential solutions? Great, thank you so much for having me and thank you everybody for um, discussing this important issue today. Uh, so drug shortages, like everybody said, has have been a very uh, ongoing chronic problem in our pharmaceutical market in the United States. And I would just want to amplify that right now, you know, of course, oncology is an area with serious concern because it's these are critical medications to save the lives of our patients. But also at any point in time, there's actually hundreds of drugs in shortages. Hospitals, just like the Johns Hopkins Hospital, they have to do every day, they have to make difficult decisions in how to substitute products that are in shortage. Another very important group is antibiotics, for example. You know, all of these life-saving drugs we saw during the COVID pandemic, it helped exacerbate these ongoing issues and bring more attention to these problems. So drug shortages, they don't only have, um, you know, problems in terms of spending, in drug management, there's these very acute outcomes, clinical impact on patients that, um, th that are so important to all of us. And so uh, as Ting Long mentioned, um, our supply of pharmaceuticals, it depends on a chain. It depends on a sequence of events happening in a, in a correct and, and positive way so that drugs can be produced, can be sold, can be distributed, et cetera. And there's multiple failures in this chain that have been occurring. Of course, manufacturing quality has been the biggest one, but it's not the only one. Very recently, we saw in the end of our winter here in the United States, we saw shortages of very common medications such as Tylenol, Ibuprofen for children, because all of a sudden there was an increase in demand. There were no 
necessarily not a manufacturing problems, but a surge in demand and our supply chain was not ready to, um, to account for that. So in the supply chain, I would just highlight there are problems with manufacturing of drugs, and that's a, a very important and pressing issue. But there's also some uh, shortages that have been happening because of an extreme and intense spike in demand for these drugs. And our supply chain has been fine-tuned for, for the markets where it works, has been fine-tuned for the demand that we currently have. And um, when that demand spikes or modifies all of a sudden, such as during the COVID pandemic or more recently uh, with the, all the respiratory infections um, having spiked in our winter, you know, we have this increase in demand and that alone can cause a shortage because we don't have an additional, um, you know, a buffer market for certain drugs. And so um, potential solutions for this, I think, first of all, we should better understand our supply chain. Like Ting Long said, um, the vast majority of our drugs included branded, but also most importantly, the generic drugs, because generic drugs are the main group that has been susceptible to shortages. Um, and so vast majority of, of generic drugs is produced overseas. Our own research here at Johns Hopkins has shown that um, less than 15 percent of all the active ingredients that are needed to make our generic drugs are produced in the United States. You know, over 85% is produced internationally. And there are many drugs that even though we can see in the United States, when we monitor, we see, oh, there's like four or five companies manufacturing these drugs. There are actually many drugs that only have one facility in the entire globe that is producing that active ingredient for that drug for the United States. So active ingredients are, um, you know, the basic material, the, the, the active molecule that will be producing the clinical effect of drug. And then, um, you know, um, the pharmaceutical manufacturers that will create a pill out of that or a solution or an injection, they typically outsource and they purchase these active ingredients from other companies. And, um, you know, 85% of these active ingredients is produced somewhere else that is not the United States and has to be shipped here which creates all sorts of additional problems with, you know, other country sovereignty and may, you know, gives, puts us in a, in a sensitive situation where all of a sudden supply can be interrupted because of some other country's policies. We saw that uh, with India export bans during the COVID pandemic um, for, for, for a period of time, India suspended exports of the ingredients for Tylenol because they wanted to, um, you know, to make sure that they had enough supply for their country. So these um, these shortages, they they have, you know, a global um, roots, roots in the global market, and they also have global implications because other countries also experience these shortages. And um, yes, better um, inspections, better monitoring would be really important, but also understanding and recognizing where our drugs are located, who is producing these drugs. We found that over one third of all the active ingredients that we needed as a country to produce our generic drugs are produced by one single facility. Of course, it's not the same facility, but there's only one manufacturer of these active ingredients somewhere in the, in the world, you know? And another third is produced by either two or three facilities. So that in itself creates serious vulnerabilities that all of a sudden, you know, one of these facilities shutting off can eliminate all our production of, you know, uh, key drugs and antibiotics are a good example of that. So it's not only about onshoring, it's not only about bringing production into the United States, it's also about understanding where production is happening, better monitoring the quality of that production, and really about diversifying. Um, with the United States, it was really interesting finding in our research is that of facility inspections, when the FDA inspects a facility, they issue a warning letter if they find anything, uh, you know, uh, of concern. And U.S. facilities had the same rate of warning letters as international facilities. So it's not only about bringing the production to domestic, um, to, to the domestic market, it's also about monitoring that production and diversifying, having more than one manufacturer for these drugs. And thinking about solutions, how we can implement that. So um, regulation is part of it, understanding and recognizing that drugs, especially, you know, drugs that are depending on one active ingredient manufacturer, 
these drugs should be uh, prioritized for approval. The FDA knows where the um, active ingredient production is happening, but it, we need some cross, uh, we need to collect that information and understand, you know, even if we have four or five manufacturers of a finished product, they're all buying from the same active ingredient. So that next step in understanding the supply chain needs to happen and the prioritization of vulnerable drugs should happen. In addition to that, our market from a purchasing perspective is extremely concentrated. So we have only three drug wholesalers in the country that really, you know, um, concentrate all the drug transactions in, in terms of drug inventory. And only these wholesalers know who they are selling to, where is their inventory located geographically in the United States. So for example, during the COVID pandemic, we had an outbreak in New York, an increased demand for certain drugs, especially drugs necessary to um, ventilate people, to set, you know, sedatives and antibiotics and things like that. We had an increase in demand in that area, but wholesalers, not necessarily had an incentive to uh, sh uh, shift their inventories in, and uh, meet the increased demand of New York hospitals because they also had contracts with other regions. And so um, that's a proprietary information and how, how these wholesalers allocate. But more importantly, perhaps than allocation is the fact that these companies decide from which manufacturer they want to purchase their inventories. So even if the FDA were to say, you know what, there's a facility here that has perfect manufacturing practices. This is an incredible facility. They're doing everything right. If our wholesalers decided to not purchase from that facility, all of that effort would be um, unsuccessful in changing the perspective on supply chain issues. So there's also no good level of transparency between service providers and hospitals and the wholesalers that they are purchasing their drugs from. And so they don't know, you know, imagine a hospital has to purchase a certain generic drug and they have an option to purchase it for a more expensive price versus a lowest price. They also today have no reason to justify purchasing a more expensive drug because there is no quality measure. We don't have another signal that is additional to price that could um, create transparency and understanding in the supply chain. Okay. This is a drug from a manufacturer that can be trusted, that is investing in good manufacturing practices. So um, having more transparency, a greater understanding, and also having purchasers um, uh, have acquire more information on the drugs that they are acquiring. So for example, quality metrics to know would be great. Um, one of the um, things that I see as an important new signal in our market, you know, we talk a lot about disruption. So we have certain manufacturers that have been disrupting the market. One of them being Civicar X, for example, Mark Cuban, Cost Plus Drug Company, um, the state of California having uh, launched an initiative to produce their own drugs, generic drugs. So we see some new players in the market trying to resolve the failures uh, in these issues, but there's also an element of, you know, who is purchasing the drugs from these uh, manufacturers. Um, to this point, you know, we haven't seen a, a system-wide disruption, especially because of the significant barrier that is represented by these wholesalers in these, um, this very concentrated purchasing market that um, really, you know, takes decisions that impact all of us. Thanks so much, Mariana. And before I turn to our final panelist, I do want to remind those who are watching, I see your questions coming in. Please continue to submit them. And in just a few minutes, we'll move on to Q&A. But first, Josh, I'll turn to you. And of course, you have extensive experience with, with FDA, um, which has already come up several times in this briefing. Can you tell us what opportunities and challenges relative to prescription drug shortages do you see for FDA or for FDA in conjunction with other agencies? Sure. Thanks so much, Lainey. Thanks for the chance to be part of this. So um, let me um, start by recalling, and these discussions so far have really brought me back, to um, over a decade ago when I was working as the principal deputy commissioner at the FDA, and we were really seeing drug shortages creep onto the radar for the first time. And there were two things that I noticed. First of all, um, people weren't aware. So we would say, look, we need to do more on drug shortages and we'd be doing briefings and people would say, well, 
I haven't heard of that. Now that's obviously changed, but this was at the beginning and the concept that a drug shortage could be a real threat to health in this country really didn't exist. And of course, now you heard from Dr. Fader, this is an amazingly serious problem for so many patients right now. The second thing, and this was clear right from the beginning, is that our system is not designed to address drug shortages in the usual manner of business. The FDA approves products, payers pay for products, health systems use products, but none of them really have the full responsibility and authority over drug shortages. It's a gap. And one of the things that we started talking about early is like, well, who's responsible and what is the power that they need to be on top of this problem and to have a strategy? And I think a decade later, we um, there have been all kinds of additional dimensions of this problem revealed. Its severity has gotten a lot worse, but we still don't really have um, an agency designated to be the lead with clear responsibility and authority for the things that need to happen. In fact, I just typed into Google drug shortages. I got the FDA drug shortages page, 207 active drug shortages. And I got a news article saying that the FDA a chief for cancer drugs was saying that FDA doesn't have the power to do some of the things that are necessary to address them. And I think he's right. I think that what we need is a real strategy with an empowered agency working with other agencies. We could talk maybe whether that agency should be FDA or another agency that really do the things that are necessary. So what are those things? I'm going to try to weave together very briefly um, uh, three different areas, awareness, prevention, and response. So first, awareness. We have to understand more about drug shortages. And oftentimes, uh, the agency is hearing about drug shortages right when it's happening. And that is too late. You know, there needs to be responsibility for um, companies to alert FDA when problems are starting to come up. There has to be the ability also to see the supply in different parts of the country so we can really understand the scale of a shortage. Is it a geographic shortage, like what happened during COVID, maybe where there were a lot of COVID patients in one part of the country, certain drugs were in shortage, but then maybe there's plenty of drugs in other areas that could be moved over. So really understanding the awareness and in some cases, compelling people to say whether they have the medications is really necessary to understand the scale of drug shortages. And I, I don't think that authority fully exists. The second is prevention. And certainly uh, heard about quality from, from Ting Long. Um, I uh, maybe have a slightly different view of FDA's inspectional capabilities than Ting Long, but I do accept the premise that it is hard to imagine FDA alone um, doing um, a sufficient number of full inspections around the world um, to, to really feel confident given um, the scale of uh, the entire enterprise of pharmaceutical manufacturing. I think a really important component of this is collaboration with other regulatory agencies, right? These companies are not just making drugs for the US market, they're making drugs around the world. The generic drug market is global. And one of the critical um, challenges and opportunities is for FDA to collaborate with others, to share information um, about our inspections with others and get information about their inspections and work so that plants are routinely inspected, not necessarily every time by someone taking a plane from, from the United States um, or from one of the FDA outposts, but potentially from a trusted partner. And um, that some of that will require, I think, congressional legislation to really be able to do well. Um, there is also regulation that, that's important in, in some areas. And you know, in, um, in areas like vaccines, there are stockpiles now, there may need to be stockpiles. And stockpiles are an interesting concept. A way to do that is to ask manufacturers and to pay manufacturers to maintain essentially a longer shelf. So they may have a six month supply on hand or something and, and they're selling the stuff that's six months old and stuff's going onto the shelf on the other end. So if there is a problem for certain critical medications, then there's at least a backup supply that we know is available. And so now who has the ability to do that? It's not the FDA now. I don't know if it's really anyone for a lot of these products, but empowering an agency to do that would be helpful. And the third issue is the underlying economics. And you heard about that from Mariana. Um, I think that um, 
you know, we have a weird feast and famine approach to drug pricing in this country. We have some drugs that are extremely expensive, and we have some drugs that are probably too cheap than they need to be. And I think Ting Long called it a uh, poorly, poorly information, low cost market. And frankly, we probably should be paying more for those medications so that the supply chain is more robust. And how to go about doing that certainly exceeds uh, my understanding, but I've heard, you know, different kinds of ideas. And that sort of um, payment policy um, and approach is probably not an FDA issue. It's probably for another agency that is also coordinated as part of a national strategy. Then the third area we've been talking about is response. Okay, there's a shortage. You know, we wanted to prevent it, but it happened. What can we do? And so the FDA has done some incredibly creative and important things, allowing importation sometimes of foreign uh, supplies and medications where necessary. Um, I do think that it, there should be the authority in extraordinary circumstances to move medications around, particularly when there are spot shortages due to demand. Um, and you don't want to have uh, patients in one part of the country who can't get a cancer treatment, but in another part of the country, they're hoarding the medicines. I, I'm not saying that's happening, but I think some agencies should be aware of that. And if it is happening, be able to help the patients who are in the uh, greatest need. And then there's this very interesting um, kind of response, which is, should we have some bit backup manufacturing capacity in the US? Um, it's complicated to try to move this massive entire industry all on shore, doesn't necessarily solve the problem. We probably do need more American manufacturing capacity generally, I would agree with that. But there may also be a need for some emergency manufacturing capacity, some flexible manufacturing capacity that could actually make a bunch of different drugs depending on which ones are really in trouble. Um, and that way, you don't necessarily have to solve every single drug independently, but you have some backup capacity for response. And I know that those kinds of ideas are getting a, a look. You know, thinking about that capacity question is not necessarily an FDA issue. So I think that um, this is a problem and it's gotten worse and worse and worse in part because it's not exactly anyone's job with the full authority to deal with it. And that really is a fundamental gap that needs to change for, for this problem to to uh, get better. Thanks, Lainey. Thanks so much, Josh. And we're now going to transition to q and I do see more questions coming in, and I want to assure our audience, if you continue to submit questions, um, I will continue to keep an eye on them for the next 25 minutes or so, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. Josh, I want to start off by picking up on something that you mentioned just a moment ago in, in your remarks, and that concerned trusted partners for for FDA to work with, potentially. I was hoping you could expand on that a little bit. And when you think about who trusted partners might be, is that exclusively partners in the public sector? Could it also be in the private sector? Um, I think the first uh, shot at this is going to be partners in the public sector. I think we, we know that there are um, very capable regulators with great um, inspection services in different parts of the world and that we need to build capacity in other parts because it's a really important um, skill for a country to have if it has a domestic manufacturing uh, capacity. And food and drug regulation really needs to be um, a global enterprise. That doesn't mean everyone does everything. You know, we could talk separately about the approval step. Does every country need to have the you know, super experts in some very rare technology, I would probably say no to that. But does every country need to be able to do a good drug inspection given if there's manufacturing there? I think they do. And so it's about investing in capacity in certain places, identifying agencies that are there and ready and really working with them. And some of that is happening. FDA has been leading a lot of that. Dr. Hamburg, who I work for at FDA, this was a major focus. But there are definitely areas where, um, uh, the U.S. can share more data um, and where um, more collaboration and a real commitment to doing this, I think, would would really help with the quality issues that Ting Long was talking about. Now, the issue of private, I'm, I'm, I, I think I probably would put myself in the need to be convinced category. Um, now, it does happen for food and some people would say to a little bit of a mixed record there. Um, uh, I think you'd really um, have to look at the plan and talk it through first. I think the lower hanging fruit, as they say, would be with the public partners. Thanks, Josh. 
So we've heard a lot already in this briefing about um, looking overseas, challenges overseas, and we have several questions that have come in asking about um, getting prescription drugs from our neighbors to the north and south, meaning Mexico or Canada. So Ting Long, can you speak to what what are the, the challenges with that? Or have there been um, instances of success? Well, uh, I, that's an excellent question. Instance of success, we have seen some evidence suggesting that they are doable. For example, to think about a COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing, that's just incredible story, success story of onshoring or even friend shoring, right? It has been mostly, we have been mostly rely on uh, this trusty network of friends and uh, from ideologically compatible countries that has been definitely proven success. So this is definitely doable. Um, now, uh, why we are not seeing more of a manufacturing, more of a sourcing from Mexico or Canada, uh, I, I guess it's complicated. But one thing I think Mariana pointed out is that we really have just three large wholesalers. They really decide where to purchase, where to source. And, and so, so really, even if we build there, they're not going not necessarily going to come, right? Uh, and the, the other aspect, I think, uh, as Josh hi highlighted here, is that um, the fundamental uh, so even if that happens, may, may or may not be helpful in solving the shortage of problems. Uh, in fact, after the meet, uh, some of the best analysis done about drug analysis is actually done by FDA and experts, the agency itself. Mm -hmm. It's really balanced, really comprehensive. Uh, but part of those findings is actually more about uh, an admission of um, defeat, really saying that, you know, we know how to solve the problem. We just don't have the power, don't have the resources to do it. So as I said earlier, FDA is really giving an impossible task to achieve. We cannot account FDA to do it alone. So we need to do more of a collaboration and between US and the foreign partners. In this case, look at the Mexican uh, counterparts, Canadian counterparts. So that collaboration is there, but we need more of that to, so, so that we can support this agenda of reducing drug shortages by bringing um, manufacturing closer to where we are. So broadly speaking, I'm very supportive of the idea of near shoring. So uh, at least make sure they are closer. So uh, like Mariana pointed out, even in that case, FDA, you know, even that does not guarantee safety, but it's easier, it's a more manageable problem. Right now, the whole global supply chain network um, of Generic drug manufacturing is just not manageable. So we need to admit that. Laney, may I add to that? Please. Uh, a bit that, to that excellent uh, response by Ting Long. I mean, the FDA protects public health essentially by promoting supply chain integrity and working to ensure medicines that are imported to the US, whether they are conventionally FDA approved medications or, emer or, or approved for emergency use, have the applicable you know, legal safety and regulatory requirements in place. So. Uh, imported drugs must meet FDA standards for quality, safety, and effectiveness, as, as Ting Long and, and, and Josh Marian have all mentioned. And the FDA currently at this time is absolutely exploring emergency importation of chemotherapy drugs, especially those in most critical shortage. Um, they have successfully done this in the past. In many instances, uh, one example a decade ago is was the Doxel uh, chemotherapy drug shortage where we imported a uh, drug and that was necessary because that shortage lasted for, for over a year. Um, but the drugs do need to pass the same rigorous inspections and requirements as conventionally FDA approved drugs. So that process does take time. Thanks, Amanda. And actually, Amanda, I was going to send this next question to you. And it's, it's a composite of several that are coming in. I think many of our viewers are hoping that you could tell us a little bit more about what this actually looks like for you or for your colleagues in clinical practice right now and the types of decisions that, that you're having to make. Thank you for that question. So I, I wear another hat. I'm a, a, a leader in the Society of Gynecologic Oncology in my field. And we actually, to understand the scope of this problem, conducted a national survey of our 3,000 oncology members across the country. This survey was sent out initially in, in late April. And 
when responses first started rolling in, we were hearing from smaller infusion centers, smaller hospitals in rural or suburban areas as being in shortage. But over the course of the last five weeks, those responses have exploded. And we are now hearing, uh, we've heard from providers in over 40 states as uh, working in a hospital with one or more critical chemotherapy drugs in shortage. So this is quickly impacting almost every hospital in the U.S. right now. Uh, it's, it is a problem locally and regionally and nationally. And, uh, you know, right now uh, what we're doing, um, both at Johns Hopkins and at the national level through multiple medical societies like the Society of Junior Oncology, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, is we're working to keep our patients' well-being and health as, as the as the priority. And we're working um, to um, ensure that as many patients as possible are receiving standard care therapies. Uh, we have drug preservation uh, guidelines that we've implemented at many centers where we're not letting any drop of chemotherapy go to waste, um, improving opportunities to um, to spread the wealth in, in terms of uh, getting more mileage out of the chemotherapy drugs that we do have on hand. We're working directly with the drug manufacturers um, and with uh, the group purchasing organizations that help us help healthcare systems obtain these medications um, and, and speaking with them on a weekly basis to ensure that we're getting supply of the, the drugs that we need. But the other critical thing that we're doing is uh, many societies have developed alternative chemotherapy drug guidelines. And that is to say that we're using best available evidence from uh, rigorous clinical trials um, to look at drug substitutions, as Mariana um, eloquently discussed before, is that substitutions are sometimes required. And in many cases, these drug substitutions are going to be as effective in terms of the response to the treatment um, as, as the standards of care that may be in shortage, like the cisplatin and, and carboplatin drugs. However, many of these drugs may carry, uh, you know, worse side effect profiles or different dosing schedules that require two to three times longer to administer. And so hospital systems and physicians and nurses and phar pharmacists are all working together to, to create new workflows around this so that we can get our patients treated with the best possible drugs um, and, and do so in a timely fashion. Thanks, Amanda. Mariana, question, question for you, and this concerns generics. So can you talk a bit about the margins on generics and where you see um, the potential for incentives to improve quality or competition? And maybe first um, beginning with just, what do we mean when we say generics? Thank you for that question. So uh, when we talk about generics, you know, typically these are unpatented drugs so drugs that can have multiple manufacturers um, producing the same compound, producing the same pill or injectable, and they can compete in the same market. What I find really interesting is that, you know, when we ask about importation, I just wanted to kind of bring the point back how actually many of our drugs are already imported because they are produced overseas, right? From the active ingredients, oftentimes even the finalized product, the difference between what we consider importation and the products that are actually in our shelves today is that the products that are in our shelves, they have um, an entity, a manufacturer that applied and passed through all the FDA standards. But oftentimes it's the same product that was just sold to another country. In our research, we found that most facilities that we examined that were producing these active ingredients, on average, these facilities had two to three other international agencies inspecting the same facility in addition to the FDA. So, you know, if products are sold in Canada or Mexico or Europe, very likely they are coming from the same exact sources that, than our products. And we are competing in the global market for that resource, especially because, you know, like these are generic, so anybody could produce. And um, there are countries, one of the surprises we found in our study you know, typically people talk about China and India as being the main manufacturers, but a very important surprise was that actually the number two manufacturer was Italy, right behind India and ahead of China in our study. So that was very surprising. And so um, th these generics, they are being already, quote, imported and brought into our country from these sources. And the question about, you know, margins and these incentives as to what generics are going to be purchased and actually um, stored and distributed in our country, there's there's a, a piece of information that I find very important is um, when we talk about the decision making, you know, which product will be purchased, which product will be stored. There's 
very, very low transparency in the pricing of these generic products. Even though they're generics, their pricing is not transparent. It was a, one very interesting research from University of Southern California. And uh, they, in 2020, they found that looking at 2018 data, comparing generics, the most frequently uh, used generics in the Medicare program, the Medicare was overspending on these generics as compared to prices offered by Costco, you know, prices offered by Costco are, you know, direct to consumers. So it could be in, understood as a transparent price. So uh, Medicare on one year was paying almost $3 billion extra for the same generics as compared to Costco prices. So the question is, you know, where are these billions going? Whose hands are they going to? So, you know, are, is our system really favoring drugs because they are better, because they have better quality, because you know, they're more resilient to shortages, or is our system rewarding drugs just because of the, you know, profit potential that they generate to these intermediaries in our supply chain, creating not only no additional spending, but also creating this ongoing vulnerability that we see to, to shortages. And that's really a, a critical problem. Thanks, Mariana. And you just you just raised a lot of good questions. So I want to pause and ask if any of our other panelists want to jump in on this one before I change topics. I, I would just say I have um, really appreciated learning from Mariana and others about the complexity of the drug markets. There is no office that studies this at FDA, you know, how the um, purchasing organizations affect the supply chain. There are some people elsewhere at HHS who do work in this area. Um, there is um, no real, you know, coordinated policy making around this at this point. And I think it emphasizes the point I was making before that we have to see this as a public health problem that needs a comprehensive strategy, needs some, you know, particular part of the federal government to focus on it and put all the tools on the table. Some of them may make sense to you, some of them may not make sense to use, but it can't just be with people doing what's in their jurisdiction and hoping that the whole problem will be solved. This is a, in a way, you know, a type of, um, uh, it, it's, it's an organizational failure, not just, um, you know, pointing at a particular person working in a complex system. It's that we don't have the structure to deal with the problem that's this complex right now. Thanks, Josh. Before I move on, anyone else want to jump in on this one? Okay, then I'm, I'm going to keep going um, and I'll switch topics a bit. Ting Long, I'm going to start with you on this one, but I suspect some of our other panelists may want to jump in. What risks do we know of that are posed to the drug supply change by climate, uh, the drug supply chain by climate change? Very, very good one. And, uh, well, like I talked about, uh, you know, quality issues uh, earlier. So I, I think climate change yes, is going to ca cause a lot of disruptions. Um, you know, from manufacturing perspective, that's part of my, my expertise. Look at manufacturing operations. We know that during the COVID nineteen pandemic, there was a lack of preventive maintenance happening because when things move to remote or uh, work to work from home. There's no way for you to do uh, preventive maintenance effectively if you work from home. Um, so we saw more fire accidents. We saw more of you know, machinery failures. And we saw a lot of supply chain disruptions, actually, uh, part, in part caused by that. So I, I just thought that, you know, the climate change just really heightens the necessity of strengthening our quality control system. Uh, I don't want to repeat the same thing, but I just want to say the fact that, you know, the quality is really quality issues account for 62% of the drug shortages we have seen. Uh, and and it, it is a root cause for the ongoing cancer drug shortage. So when we bring climate change into this picture, and it, it's just going to make problem worse. The, so the other part is that, you know, as U.S. agencies deal with climate change, we're going to just have more and more environmental regulations, uh, more and more ESG pressure for those who don't know environmental, social and governance wow. issues. Um, I have very complicated feelings about this, right? Because when you have a lot of these regulations, what do companies do? Well, they move their facility to China, to India, to Mexico, to Europe, to places where regulation is weaker, 
it's hard to see the actual environmental performance, the actual safety records. So I, I think I want to back to George's point is that we need to really look look at comprehensive solutions, look at the general equilibrium. So when we um, strengthen environmental regulations, when we think about the climate change, we should think about what companies will in response uh, move, uh, how they're going to change their supply chain networks in response. Uh, because it has non-trivial um, uh, implications. And, and we know that FDA cannot do this. The FDA is not designed to this. FDA is facing impossible task. task. And even if we have new agencies, even if we have a coordination among agencies, there's no way we can do this, right? Because time and again, this has been proven. So this is a failure by design. And we need to really, anytime we have any sort of initiatives related to climate change, we need to worry about what the companies are going to do. And, and by the way, this is not just about healthcare, pretty much all the sectors. And greenwashing is a real issue. So companies generally move stuff uh, out of the US and when they have tough regulations, basically outside and up in uh, and up, up, up the mind. Thanks, Ting Long. And given the diversity of expertise, I want to give our other panelists a chance. Does anyone else want to weigh in on the um, interface of prescription drug shortages and climate change? I would like to make a comment uh, on this. So uh, in the 70s, the U.S. established some tax incentives to um, foster drug production in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico was a very important source for um, intravenous solutions. So imagine, you know, intravenous solutions, you, you're talking about sterile products. They have to be, you know, very well produced so we can trust them. But then we had Hurricane Maria affecting the island. And then all of a sudden we had shortages, very severe shortages of these um, intravenous solutions. So part of the um, solution in the preparedness to climate change events I think like Josh was saying, we cannot predict where and when they will happen, but we can predict that they will and that climate change will create disruption. So um, within you know, the scope of solutions, there must be solutions that anticipate, for example, a preparedness for um, urgent manufacturer capabilities um, and also diversification. Again, you know, when we have more um, manufacturers, you know, in multiple places manufacturing, then we already have the capacity in a certain place is all about, you know, ramping up that capacity in a short basis. But um, diversification and preparedness, having the capacity to easily shift a certain production line, for example, in domestic soil in the continental US, you know, all of a sudden to produce uh, these uh, injectable sterile solutions would have been critical, would have helped resolve these shortages that we had after the hurricane. And unfortunately, we did not have that at the time. Thanks, Mariana. Anyone else want to jump in on climate change or else I'll, I'll move to another topic? Okay, Josh, I'm going to send this one um, to you given, given your time with, with FDA. So we're getting a few questions coming in about how to best conceptualize the root cause of prescription drug shortages? And for example, should we be thinking about shortages of chemotherapy drugs in the same way that we would think about shortages of ADHD medications? Does it all kind of come back to the same thing or are there actually different paths here? I think, I think it's a final common pathway for a lot of different challenges. Um, the ADHD drug shortage is complicated and has to do with how um, amounts are set by DEA to be sold in this country, that's a very different challenge than a generic drug manufacturer someplace in the world um, having a awful inspection like Ting Long described. Those are very different things. And so, you know, over time, you know, a drug could have one kind of shortage and then have another kind of shortage, but to the patient, they just can't get what they need. So I, I think it really does require a recognition of this as a problem that requires a a solution that will have different components. And as probably the point I'm making one too many times, an, an entity that is actually responsible for it ac across all these different issues within the federal government. Thanks, Josh. And Amanda, I'm going to send this last question to you. And I do say last because I'm pretty sure you're going to get the final word in this briefing. So um, as, um, as a clinician, 
What's your best advice to folks that are listening to this and are really concerned for themselves, for their family, um, for loved ones relative to prescription drug shortages? What, what are you telling your patients? Thank you so much for that question, Lainey. Uh, yeah, patients are at the center of, of, of all of this with any prescription drug shortage. And uh, at Hopkins and many other centers around the country, this drug shortage is, is the top priority uh, right now. Um, and I would say that there's hope on the horizon, at least in the acute period, as um, several of the um, uh, that as the leading manufacturer that was offline for a few months uh, due to the issues that Ting Long and, and, and Josh and Mariana had had discussed um, is now back online. Um, the FDA and the federal government, the Biden administration are all working closely together um, uh, with these companies um, and with uh, uh, foreign uh, companies as well uh, to to bring in more drug quickly to infuse that into the marketplace. And we see that in the next two to four weeks, that's going to abate significantly from from uh, all of our sources at the at the federal government and the FDA. I would say, though, that um, uh, we've been able at most hospitals to keep patients on track with standard of care therapies um, and that every hospital in the U.S. is working on this very diligently. Um, uh, and, uh, and again, to use chemotherapy responsibly, preserve the extended drug supply. Uh, and as we approach this critical juncture where this crisis has worsened over the last two weeks, uh, ensure that no patient is left behind and that no patient is told that she, that they cannot receive the, the, the drugs they need to save their lives. Um, in the long term, I think we need we, we desperately need solutions. And um, there's an, uh, a number of bills now in Congress uh, that are being discussed. Our team at Hopkins is meeting next week with the House Cancer Caucus to discuss this legislation and uh, you know other strategies uh, at the federal level. Um, uh, to revise the mission, for example, of the Assistant Secretary for Strategic Planning and Response um, to, in, to uh, endorse the Drug Shortage Prevention Act that is a bipartisan bill that's being introduced um, to allow FDA greater oversight and earlier notification of the shortages has, has been discussed several times to look at opportunities uh, to, for centralized emergency uh, repository of drugs and other strategies. And with the FDA to ensure that some of these, these chemotherapy agents are not on the essential drugs list at, at the level of the FDA, which was surprising to me as a clinician. So we're working with the FDA and others um, so that we can enact you know, longer term solutions here for our patients. Thank you, Amanda. And with that, I'll wrap up. I'd like to thank our panelists, Amanda Fader, Ting Long Dai, Mariana Sokol and Josh Sharfstein for joining me today. I'd also like to send a big thank you to everyone who attended this briefing and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts. A recording of this event will be made available on this website. Today's panelists together with many faculty from across Johns Hopkins will continue to work on prescription drug shortages and other issues that impact all of our futures. Thank you again for joining us.